So here it is, finally. You guys wanted this. I did not know it was going to turn into the behemoth that it has become, but I'm done now. And wow, I didn't realize how much this was like weighing on me, like not having this done until I finished it. And I mean, I'm not done yet. I still need to do what I'm doing right now and edit and everything, but like the hard part's done and oh, it feels so good. Anyway, this is actually the third video in the series. The first one is on eating disorders causing dieting because this is something that many intuitive eaters believe. And then the second one is on health at every size. Can you be healthy at every size? Again, because this is something that many intuitive eaters believe. I'm going to focus a lot on the book Intuitive Eating by dietitians Evelyn Tribble and Elise Raish because they're kind of like the OG intuitive eaters. This book came out in 1995. They didn't come up with the concept, but they did help to popularize it. And the 10 principles that everyone uses, they came up with those. Finally, I am not a dietitian. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not an uh, obesity researcher, neuroscientist, anything like that. I have no credentials whatsoever when it comes to diet or nutrition or health or obesity or anything like that. These are simply my thoughts when it comes to intuitive eating based on the like research that I've done as someone who, again, has no sort of expertise in any of this. I'm sure there are plenty of people who have found success with intuitive eating, just like there are plenty of people who have found success with like literally any diet you can imagine, <laughs> like whatever success looks like for them, right? So if you are considering trying intuitive eating, don't let my thoughts or my criticisms here deter you. So for those who don't know, there are 10 principles of intuitive eating. Again, these are from Tribble and Raish. They're on their website, intuitiveeating.org. One is reject diet mentality. So no more dieting, calorie counting, weighing or measuring yourself, that sort of stuff honor your hunger. So like, don't let yourself get too hungry. Basically, when you are hungry, it means you need to eat something. Don't starve yourself in an attempt to lose weight. Make peace with food. So no restriction, no food is off limits. If you want to eat 10 cookies, eat the 10 cookies. Doing the opposite, restricting foods is why we end up having cravings and feeling out of control when it comes to foods. This is according to intuitive eaters. Challenge the food police. So stop moralizing food. You're not bad if you eat certain foods or eat too much of a certain food. Discover the satisfaction factor. This is just, you know, remember that food is enjoyable and try to enjoy your meals. Number six, feel your fullness. So pay attention to your hunger and your fullness cues while you're eating. If you're full, stop eating. If you're still hungry, get some more food. Cope with your emotions with kindness. So try to deal with the kind of stressors in your life in a non-food related way. Respect your body. You know, love yourself no matter your size. Pretty self-explanatory. Movement, feel the difference. So exercise for health and enjoyment rather than just to lose weight. And finally, number 10, honor your health. Eat healthy foods, focus on nutrition without becoming obsessive about it. If you have an unhealthy meal, it's not going to completely destroy your health or anything like that. Um, there's a reason that this is the last principle. It's supposed to be kind of the last step in your journey. You're not even supposed to focus on nutrition when you're just getting into intuitive eating. And it can be even for a, you know, a long time after you've started intuitive eating, you're supposed to kind of gauge for yourself when you're ready to start adopting nutrition principles. So a lot of this sounds appealing to me. Most of it does. And I think most people would say the same. I think you'd be hard pressed to find any sort of expert saying that, yeah, crash dieting is good. And you know, if you eat a cookie, you should beat yourself up over it. And like, you should wait until you're absolutely ravenous before you start eating, right? I mean, I think most people would agree that, yeah, don't, don't do those things. I think the most controversial one, the main controversial one is number three, telling people to eat what they want as much as they want. I'll talk about that more later. Intuitive eating is also really focused on like advocating for overweight people, trying to get the general public as well as health practitioners to view fat people as people, not as pariahs, to not just assume that someone is fat because they're lazy, because they just don't care, because they've never tried dieting ever. This is what a lot of people believe. Um, I think this is really great. I think this is probably the most valuable aspect of the movement. So yeah, I like most of it. It feels right to me, you know, intuitively, I guess you could say. But uh, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. 
So a lot of studies on intuitive eating and health at every size exist, as you can see by looking at the studies page at intuitiveeating.org. That doesn't necessarily mean anything, as I'm sure Tribble and Raish are fully aware, but it certainly makes intuitive eating look super sciencey and legit. Looking at each study one by one really doesn't tell us a whole lot. There are very few randomized trials, you know, comparing a group that's following intuitive eating to a group that's following like, you know, conventional dieting. Most are just cross-sectional analyses. They are generally small and short-term with no follow-up. The vast majority of the people studied are white women. Many of the studies are not on intuitive eating specifically. They're on like health at every size or mindful eating. They're all very similar, but not quite the same. And many of the studies, including the RCTs, are not of the highest quality. Also, since the intuitive eating, you know, programs that are used in these trials, these interventions are rather intensive, you know, there's, there's training from psychologists and dietitians. positive results could be due to that, to that outside involvement rather than the intuitive eating specifically. That does seem to be what this study found. They found no significant difference between the health at every size group and the social support group in terms of eating behavior. Now, there are a lot of literature reviews and even meta-analyses on intuitive eating, including two that were both published last year that limit themselves to RCTs. This one found that health, not weight loss, is what they call, you know, these sorts of programs, intuitive eating, health at every size. They found that these programs performed better in the long run when it came to eating restraint and body satisfaction when compared to conventional dieting, but the difference was slight and relied on data from one study. There were no long-term significant differences in cholesterol levels, blood pressure, or weight loss. I know the goal isn't to lose weight, you know, health at every size, all that, but as I talked about in the last video, that's clearly wrong. Obesity is bad for us, and any sort of program, you know, diet or anti-diet that builds itself on making us healthier, not only mentally, but physically as well, should be able to help with obesity. You can cherry pick the data as some intuitive eaters do sharing studies like these, but these are cross-sectional analyses. They are not trials. They aren't putting overweight people on intuitive eating and finding that they lose more weight than people following, you know, a conventional diet. They're simply looking at the data and finding that the people who eat in response to hunger and satiety signals, so they eat when they're hungry, they stop when they're full, tend to have lower BMI. Okay, great, but they could have been eating this way forever. You know, maybe they've always been thin. Finding that people who already eat intuitively have lower BMI does not support the notion that teaching overweight people how to eat intuitively will result in weight loss. They are two completely different things. Again, the meta-analysis I already mentioned found no significant difference when compared to dieting. This other meta-analysis, also from 2019, came to the same conclusion. Mindful eating slash intuitive eating performs as well as dieting, which means badly. It performs badly. And that's nothing to say of maintaining that weight loss. There are no long-term studies on IE and weight, so it's impossible to know how well it performs in terms of keeping the weight off. So that's the science on intuitive eating based, again, on very limited research. It does no better in terms of weight loss when compared to dieting and may help slightly when it comes to things like body image and eating behavior. But the science is not how most people learn about intuitive eating. They learn about it from books like this, from IE coaches, from Reddit groups and Facebook groups, and just like people in real life. And that's kind of a problem. The first thing that really surprised me about intuitive eating by Tribble and Raish is just how much this anti-diet book reads like your typical diet book, not in the sense of, you know, calorie counting and weighing your food and weighing yourself and all that kind of stuff, but in the way that they sell the program by exaggerating and overpromising. The burden of exercise will be removed and exercising will begin to look enticing to you. When you reach the final stage, your weight will settle into what is natural for you. Letting yourself enjoy food will actually result in self-limiting rather than out of control eating. This is what diet books do. But like instead of follow our program and you'll lose weight, it's follow our program and you'll reach your natural weight and you'll have a great relationship with food and love exercising. 
It's irresponsible. I don't care how science-based your diet or non-diet is, and again, the evidence for IE is not super great. You don't ever tell someone that you have the answer, that you have the answer to what ails them, particularly when we're talking about something as contentious as health. There is no evidence suggesting any one particular diet for everyone, and there is no evidence suggesting that non-dieting is for everyone. There will always be that one person, or in this case, probably lots of people who do not respond this way to your program. And when that inevitably happens, there's a good chance they're going to feel bad and they're going to feel let down and like they failed because you told them to expect miracles. And this isn't limited to Tribble and Raish by any means. Many intuitive eaters promote intuitive eating this way. I really thought that the anti-dieting world would be different, at least in this respect. So it's kind of disappointing. Another thing that I see as a problem with the intuitive eating movement is how dieting is talked about. Dieting, calorie counting, restricting food, weighing yourself, all that sort of stuff. They're all seen as inherently bad and they just prove that you are brainwashed by diet culture if you engage in them. Statements like this, this is from the book, stop weighing yourself, remember the scale is the tool of a chronic dieter. So many people who weigh themselves do so unhealthily. I know all too well what it's like to have all of your self-esteem run by what the scale says. <laughs> you know, if it's a weight that you like when you step on it, it's a good day. If it isn't, your day's fucked. That's terrible. But I also know what it's like to use the scale as just a tool, one tool of many for monitoring my health. I weigh myself probably once a week on average, something like that, just to make sure that my weight isn't creeping up because it tends to do that every, I don't know, six months to a year, something like that. And so when that happens, because of the scale, I can see that it's happening and I can work to get my weight down to my kind of a set point range, which for me is like, I don't know, 134 to 138. Part of the reason for that is because honestly, my bras don't fit very well once I get to around 140 and bras for giant titties are outrageously expensive and just no. But honestly, the main reason is because the easiest way to fight obesity is to not become obese in the first place. It's a lot easier to stay skinny than it is to become skinny. Yes, weighing and dieting fails many people. Most people will not maintain that weight loss. They will regain the weight. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people who diet, lose the weight, and keep it off for years. I restrict a lot of foods. Obviously, I'm vegan, but also like junky vegan foods, right? It's not an ethical issue. It's just that I find that that's what works for me. You know, I've been at a stable weight, minus pregnancy, obviously, for like seven years. And it's not just me, obviously. The National Weight Control Registry, it's been around for about 25 years, includes over 10,000 Americans with an average weight loss of 66 pounds per person, and they've kept the weight off for five years on average. Everyone on the list has lost significant amounts of weight, but in different ways. About 45% of them say they lost weight following various diets on their own, for instance, and 55% say they used a structured weight loss program, and most of them had to try more than one diet before the weight loss stuck. Are all of these people chronic dieters in the sense that they have like an unhealthy obsession with dieting? Are they all secretly hiding an eating disorder? You know, you can believe in and promote intuitive eating without denigrating those of us who have chosen a different path. But I guess it makes sense considering that when intuitive eaters say dieting, they seem to mean crash dieting or fad dieting, you know, eating a very, very low calorie diet, restricting a lot of foods, you know, diets that don't last and aren't healthy, right? Here's a good example from the book. How many times have you eaten a rice cake when you really wanted potato chips? And how many rice cakes, carrots, and apples have you eaten attempting to get the same satisfaction you would have found with a handful of chips? If you feel truly satisfied with your eating experience, you will find that you eat far less food. Rice cakes, carrots, apples, that's not what? Yeah, that's not a lot of calories. It's not balanced. Of course, people aren't going to feel satisfied on that. And they might turn to chocolate or something else with more calories that isn't super healthy instead. The problem isn't wanting the chocolate. The problem is trying to replace the chocolate with stupid, unsatisfying diet food. People can diet, but still eat tasty and satisfying foods that meet their needs. I diet, I count calories from time to time, 
but I also eat like a good amount of food. I eat around like 2000 calories a day, sometimes more than that, probably most of the time more than that. <laughs> and I don't eat rice cakes. Ugh. Like I don't, when was the last, oh God, they're disgusting. <laughs> Here's another example from a certified intuitive eating counselor. Now you may be thinking, but I'm not even on a diet. Take a step back and ask yourself, what are your food rules? Are you subconsciously restricting? Do you think of carbs as bad? Do you try to stop eating at a certain time? Do you keep certain foods out of your house? Even if you aren't depriving yourself through traditional diets, the threat of future deprivation is implied when you feel guilty or shame about what you are eating. And this guilt is going to lead to cravings and overeating. Do you see what she did? Like she equates trying to stop eating at a certain time, keeping certain foods out of the house with thinking that like certain foods are bad or carbs are bad. And then at the end, she essentially says that all of this, all of these rules and whatnot, necessarily involve guilt and shame, which inevitably leads to overeating. What about those of us who have some rules? Maybe we keep certain foods out of the house because we just, you know, we have a tendency to overeat on them. We don't want to do that because they're not super healthy, lots of calories, so we keep them out of the house. Maybe we find that we do really well when we don't eat past a certain point, 7 p.m. at night or something like that. But we don't feel like guilty or shameful when we end up you know, breaking one of our rules, we end up eating at 10 p.m. or 8 p.m. or 7.30 or something like that. And it's like, oh yeah, whatever, it happens. Like, what about us? Do we just, do we just not exist? How convenient. You've probably heard of the term set point. It's what neuroscientist and obesity researcher Stefan Guillenet calls the fat thermostat. When you lose weight, your body works really hard to put the weight back on by slowing your metabolism so you burn less calories and by making you extremely hungry so you eat more calories. Intuitive eaters don't deny set point theory. They have embraced it to the point where they believe that your set point is you know, like natural. It's the weight that you are supposed to be at. But that's not what set point means. It just means the current weight range that your body will accept, that your body will urge you to return to if you lose weight. You could weigh 300 pounds. It doesn't matter. Once you have been at a weight or weight range for long enough, that becomes the weight that your body likes and it becomes very difficult to change, but not impossible. In fact, it's now thought that this is why gastric bypass works by changing the body set point. It's obviously much easier to go the other way, right? To eat more and end up raising your set point, which might make sense from an you know evolutionary standpoint. If you don't have 24 seven access to food, having a little extra weight is quite the advantage, right? I mean, being skinny just means you're gonna die quicker if you run out of food. Set point and the ability to alter it is actually the big worry that I have with intuitive eating, that someone will follow the program They'll gain weight because they aren't restricting super, you know, high calorie processed foods. They won't worry about that weight gain because they're told not to worry about the weight gain. It's just part of the process. And then they stay at that higher weight or gain even more weight for long enough that they have now raised their set point. It's going to be really hard just to get back down to their previous weight. And I think this is a pretty valid concern. Anecdotally, this seems to be the norm. Many intuitive eating coaches say to expect it, to expect that when you start, you're going to gain weight. And then eventually, you know, months later, even years later, it'll stabilize. There are multiple comments on this post from people worried about the weight they've gained, weight they are still gaining months or even years after starting intuitive eating. Lots of posts like this elsewhere too. But what about the studies? linking intuitive eating to weight loss. Like I said before, the meta-analyses that have been done have found that it's equivalent to dieting. Like I mentioned earlier, it could be the study itself that's playing a big role, you know, being involved in these intensive intuitive eating trials. Participating in weekly sessions run by a psychologist and dietitian is a far cry from reading intuitive eating just on your own. Maybe that support and structure is necessary to prevent weight gain. In one of the meta-analyses that I mentioned earlier, researchers actually speculate that just weighing participants might have something to do with it. Obviously, you're not supposed to weigh yourself on, you know, intuitive eating, health at every size, but if you are a participant in a study that's looking at intuitive eating and weight loss, 
obviously you are going to be weighed at the beginning and the end of the trial. This may have been a positive factor for achieving weight loss in the programs in these studies, which might not have otherwise been found in a non-research setting. It's impossible to say based on the limited evidence that's available, but based on you know, what we know about set point theory, what we know about leptin and obesity, the anecdotal evidence showing that intuitive eating leads to weight gain, and that no studies have shown that the weight gain eventually subsides after some amount of time. Based on all of that, it, it seems like a big risk to me. It, it's just kind of a leap of faith. Just have faith in the process, you know, have faith that at some point you'll lose the weight and even if you lose the weight, you might still be overweight, but that's fine because health at every size and I, it's, it sounds like freely, you know, it, it sounds like Ralto 4, just keep following Ralto 4. You may gain weight, you may gain weight for years, but eventually the weight will come off. It just, I'm skeptical. Now, the intuitive eating view of set point as like inherently good would make a lot more sense to me if we lived in a very different environment. If we were surrounded only by whole, unprocessed, bland foods, then yeah, I have no doubt that we would be at a healthy set point, right? Whatever our weight naturally would be eating those foods would probably be healthy for the vast majority of us. But, uh, you know, we don't live in that world. We live in a world full of cookies and cakes and chips and lasagna and burgers and fries and spicy, sweet, chili Doritos. These are the foods that are most likely to cause cravings and a loss of control over eating because their physical properties make them exceptionally reinforcing, motivating, and palatable. Researchers have an umbrella term for this combination of effects on the brain, food reward. Some people are less susceptible to these foods or just food in general. It's not as rewarding. And so they can be around super high calorie, delicious food and even eat it and still maintain a healthy weight. But obviously for most of us, that's just not the reality. We really like these foods. We eat too much and we gain weight. There are a lot of possible reasons for this, including genetics. Genetics likely plays a large role. You know, people who naturally value food more and are highly impulsive are more likely to have intense cravings and then give in to those cravings. So how does intuitive eating get around all of this? I mean, this this is the crux of the issue. This is, <laughs> this is why we're all so unhealthy because we are surrounded by these utterly delicious, unhealthy foods. How does intuitive eating deal with this? They deny it. If you never have to be deprived of a favorite food again, you won't have a great urge to overdo on it. With intuitive eating, those forbidden, naughty foods lose their power and are demoted to being just ordinary food. Chocolate starts to take on the same emotional connotation as a peach. People aren't getting fat on peaches. <laughs> the idea that the reason for that is because people aren't restricting peaches like they are chocolate is just not supported by the evidence whatsoever, including like anecdotal evidence, our own personal experiences. So I never restricted food when I was younger. Pre-dieting, when I started dieting in my teens, I ate whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And our house, <laughs> It was insane. It was a cornucopia of trash and it was wonderful. We had like 10 boxes of cereal in the house at all time and not like cinnamon life or any of that shit, which is delicious, but you know what I mean? Like it was fruit roll or not fruit roll-ups, uh, fruit loops, Count Chocula when that was out, you know, the Rice Krispie Treat cereal. Oh my God, that was one of my favorite. I would actually make my mom go to the other Kroger where they would stock it just to get it. I was horrible. But anyway, we had so much junk. We had an entire freezer just for ice cream, a separate freezer for ice cream. <laughs> and I wasn't like secretly restricting. Honestly, I thought, I thought dieting was really stupid. I really, I was incredibly judgmental and horrible. I really looked down on people who dieted. I remember, I don't know why, I don't think it was for school, but I started reading this book and I didn't really know what it was about before I started reading it, but it was like a, you know, kind of young adult book, you know, geared towards teens. And it was about this girl and she started vomiting after she ate. And I just thought, what? This is so like disgusting. What's wrong with you? Like just eat food. Are you an idiot? This is horrible. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Like 
<laughs> I fucking deserve that. I was a little bit chunky. I mean, like kind of how I am now, you know, I'm not like super skinny by any means, but I wasn't overweight. So apparently I was pretty good at like regulating my calories, but I was not healthy. I did not exercise. I did not go outside. It. I did not eat healthy foods. Every once in a while, I remember I would get these like intense, like I need something fresh kind of craving. And I would have like an apple and peanut butter or strawberries that were of course covered in whipped cream or dunked in sugar. But I never just like magically stopped caring about ice cream and started eating healthy. And the idea that the only reason that people are obese or have like a negative relationship with food is because they try to restrict those foods is obviously so silly. It's like saying the only reason alcoholics exist is because they try to deprive themselves of alcohol. And, you know, if only they would let themselves drink as much as they want, well, eventually the alcohol would take on the same emotional connotation of like juice or some shit. <laughs> now, I will concede that I can see this working with one food, right? Like, look, if you told me to eat as many Doritos as I wanted. If it was like, here, here's 20 bags of Doritos, eat them. Yeah, I'm sure after a few bags, it might be a lot of bags, but at some point, yes, I would become sick of those delicious, spicy, sweet chili Dor Doritos. I can't talk. But number one, that's a lot of Doritos. And number two, Doritos aren't the only junk food. You know, I've gotten sick of certain foods, certain junk foods in the past, those, I don't know if they still sell them, but Costco used to sell these like, like literally like frozen donuts in a box that you would thaw in the microwave. Oh God. I feel like if I even saw the box of those, I would just puke. So yeah, I've gotten sick of foods, but again, th there are a million junk foods out there. We eat more when there are more options available to us, right? It's called sensory specific satiety or the buffet effect. It's why we can always find room for dessert, right? No matter how filling our dinner and oh my God, we couldn't eat another bite. Well, you know, maybe a few bites of ice cream, maybe a few bites of tiramisu. Oh my God. Is there a good recipe for vegan tiramisu? Hmm. If I'm only allowed to eat Doritos, right? <laughs> And yeah, I'm sure I'd get sick of Doritos, but that's not intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is eating all the Doritos and all the cookies and all the ice cream and all the burgers and whatever else. I just don't buy that all junk food's the same, essentially. Clearly it's not. Clearly sweet and savory stuff, it goes back and forth, back and forth, and there are a million different junk foods. And maybe I don't like Doritos anymore, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to like Cocoa Whip, peanut butter Cocoa Whip sandwich still my greatest creation. Like, yeah, I have two amazing kids, but peanut butter cocoa whip sandwich exists. So like, it's, it's still my proudest accomplishment. <laughs> Satisfaction is derived when you take the time to figure out what you really want to eat, give yourself unconditional permission to eat it, and then eat in a relaxing, enjoyable atmosphere. But what if you don't know what you want to eat? I mean, sometimes I just, I honestly don't know. And I take a bite of something and, oh, it's really good. Or I take a bite of something and, oh, no, that's, nope, can't do that. Or what I really, really want, like, doesn't exist. Either have to, like, go out and buy it or I would have to make it more often than not. And I don't have the ingredients for it. And it's just, like, not, it's just not something I can have in the moment. I think we often have to settle for foods that aren't exactly what we want in the moment. We can't just follow our taste buds wherever they lead. You know? We just don't have the time or the money for that unless you have like a private chef or infinite money, I guess. And this kind of perspective and what they're encouraging here, it can also lead to a lot of waste. In this little anecdote, a woman throws out a whole batch of muffins and it's presented as a good thing because they weren't, you know, as good as the ones that the, the restaurant makes. If you don't love it, don't eat it, as the authors say. And, you know, maybe for someone in recovery from an eating disorder, this makes sense. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert, so I don't know for sure. But just as a way to live, to just throw away perfectly good food because it's not like a 10 out of 10 to you, it's pretty childish. So there's a lot of information on intuitive eating for vegans. Even Tribble and Raish aren't against it, depending on 
like why you go vegan in the first place. So if you're going vegan for weight loss, obviously that's not good. It's just another diet. But if you're going vegan for health or ethical reasons, then that's fine. And that, you know, fits in perfectly with intuitive eating, which is great. And basically my views on the issue on like health and veganism and dieting, you know, dieting, dieting doesn't work. People don't stick to it. And if you're going vegan just to lose weight or even just for health, then it's just a diet. And yeah, you're, you're probably not going to stick to it. Now, if I can kind of nitpick a little bit, I don't really see how you can really follow intuitive eating and be vegan. I mean, if you've been vegan a long time, even still, a lot of vegans want animal products. Like that's the food you want. And intuitive eating is eating the food that you want. If you want a burger and you say no because it's not vegan, how is that intuitive eating? I'm not saying don't go vegan, obviously. I'm saying that this is a big knock against intuitive eating when we look at if we when we look at diets, obviously this is an anti-diet, but we when we look at eating plans beyond just the effect that they have on us and our bodies. You know, when your only metric for whether or not a, a diet or an eating plan is good is just that it's not a diet, <laughs> right? That it's intuitive eating, then it's it's good if it's not a diet. It takes all other effects out of the equation. What if someone's intuition tells them to eat carnivore? And so they end up just eating, just eating meat. I mean, is that, is that good? Because, well, they're eating intuitively. Should we just ignore the effects that this has on the planet and obviously the animals they're eating? That's an extreme example. And I don't believe that anyone really wants to eat only meat. But I can see someone following intuitive eating and eating more animal products as a result because that's what they want to eat. It's hard for me to view that as an overall good thing. So one of the major things behind intuitive eating besides not restricting, you know, foods is to pay attention to your hunger cues and often to really learn what hunger and fullness means for you, because I think they are right that a lot of us have kind of effed ourselves in a way, either by restricting way too much or by just overeating way too much or doing both. And so, yeah, it can take a long time, especially if you have an eating disorder past like I do. It took a long time from binging so much and purging to get to a point where I could feel satisfied on like a normal amount of food, right? And to really learn like what fullness is and to not expect to feel stuffed all the time. So again, I think, I think this is great. I think this is one of the best parts of the program is to really learn what hunger and fullness feels like and to be able to tell the difference between being full and being stuffed. But this can be really, really hard for some of us, if not downright impossible. In this post from the blog, Fit is a Feminist Issue, Samantha Brennan talks about you know, hunger not being reliable, particularly when we're eating hyperpalatable foods. And she also talks about why intuitive eating doesn't work for her in particular, because she had thyroid cancer and her thyroid levels can really affect her appetite. I've talked before about how I'm usually not hungry in the morning. I'm usually not really hungry until like noon or even later. And so what happens is I wait to eat. And then by that point, I'm nauseous or almost nauseous and everything sounds disgusting. And so usually I end up eating something not so healthy, not so great, just like a bowl of carby, sugary cereal. And also because I started eating so late, it's often that my last meal is like right before bed. And so then of course I'm getting up to pee in the middle of night of the night, which means my sleep is not great. When I force myself to eat breakfast in the morning, even though I'm not very hungry, even though I really don't want it, I force myself to eat breakfast and I usually eat better the rest of the day. I have a healthy breakfast and usually the rest of my day is better too. And I don't feel nauseous and I don't have to eat at like 10 p.m. I don't think that aspect of intuitive eating, you know, listening to hunger cues makes sense to someone like me. So those are my thoughts on intuitive eating. And, you know, for the most part, I think it's great. And I think a lot of the things that they promote are things that people who have a good relationship with food already do. People who have like no issues with weight, there's a good chance that they finish eating when they're full instead of when they're stuffed, Um, that they eat when they're hungry, that they don't feel bad if they end up eating, you know, an extra piece of 
cake or cookie or something like that. Like they don't moralize food. They probably don't turn to food all the time when they're stressed or sad or mad or, you know, bored. But I just don't agree that weight has no bearing on health. And I think that most of us have to make a conscious choice, not an intuitive one. Basically say no to ourselves and be like, nah, you can't, you can't eat that. It's not good. You got to have this instead sorry. And I think many intuitive eaters get that too. Uh, so in response to the question, should I eat sweets when I'm hungry? This is in the book. Tribble and Raish say, in general, if you wait until you're hungry to eat sweets, you'll find that you may end up eating a larger quantity than you might need to satisfy your sweet tooth because you'll be trying to satisfy your biological hunger. I thought I'm supposed to eat whatever I want when I want it. What if I want cake? You know, they say, do not deprive yourself of any food that sounds appealing to you. Eating something healthier because I know the cake isn't going to satisfy me, it's not going to fill me up, it doesn't remove the desire for cake. It's not intuition. It's a choice, right? I'm making a choice based on the knowledge that the cake is not going to satisfy me. I'm making a choice to eat something healthier, even though I still want the cake. I fail to see how that's intuitive eating. Look, there's a reason that number 10 exists, and that's because we have to say no to ourselves at least sometimes. We're not always going to want healthy foods, and it's not always because of emotional eating or because we haven't reached, like, level five intuitive eater where peaches and chocolate are equal. Hyperpalatable foods are objectively tastier than healthy foods, so it's perfectly rational that we would choose a grilled cheese sandwich over, like, a salad. And look, obviously, if you really like don't want a salad, don't eat a salad. Like I don't, I don't really eat salads very often. Sometimes I really like them. Most of the time I don't. So I don't eat them. I choose other healthy foods, right? You need to find the healthy foods that you actually like. Otherwise, you're, you're never going to be happy with your diet. You're never going to be at peace with food. To be fair, number 10 is the final step. As I said earlier, you know, you're not even supposed to like say the word nutrition until you get to that point, until you've like mastered the other steps. But that can take a very long time. Time that's been spent eating lots of processed foods, gaining weight, possibly raising your set point. I just don't have much faith in any diet or anti-diet given the environment that we live in. If you get rid of all junky, delicious processed foods, then sure, I'm sure all of us could be happy, healthy, intuitive eaters. But that's not the reality. That's not intuitive eating. And who the fuck wants to do that? Who, who wants to just get rid of all the junk foods? You'll have to pry those Doritos from my cold, dead fingers. So what's the solution? Dieting? Obviously not, you know, for some people, but for most of us, no, we'll end up regaining the weight or even gaining more weight and raising our set point anyway. I mean, at least with IE, there's a chance that you'll improve your, you know, body image, self-esteem, or maybe there's a middle ground, you know, why can't we kind of mesh intuitive eating with dieting? You know, it doesn't have to be calorie counting and weighing food. It can be just, you know, focusing on whole foods and limiting processed foods, something like that. Along with that, following basically all of the 10 tenets, you know, paying attention to hunger and fullness, respecting your body, not moralizing food. Would that offer the best of both worlds? Possibly. I mean, again, hyperpalatable foods don't play by the rules. Chocolate is never going to be as satisfying as a peach. Get out of here. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnatural vegan, and I will have a new video hopefully very soon. It's kind of disappointing. It's really disappointing. Like this is one of the worst aspects of dieting to me, you know, in terms of the psychological aspect and people really feeling bad about themselves. I think we would see less of that if diets didn't push this like, it'll work for you, it'll work for you, it'll work for you. Because of course, inevitably, it's not gonna work for a lot of people and people are gonna feel bad and like they did something wrong. It's fine to try a diet or an anti-diet and it not work. Don't feel bad about it. But it's hard not to feel bad about it when you're told that if it doesn't work, it's because you did something wrong. Do you see what I mean? You know, I, I was just, I was expecting a move away from that with intuitive eating and to just see the same old shit, you know, as someone who's read 
a lot of diet books and blogs and whatnot sucks, man. And I know they'll, you know, they'll say you, you can never fail on intuitive eating and all that stuff, but it, it's not good enough. I don't think it matters how much you tell someone you can't fail, you can't fail, you can't fail. If you're also saying, hey, if you follow this program, this will happen and that doesn't happen for them. I, I don't know, man. Maybe they feel like a failure. Maybe you got to make money, I guess. I mean, is that what this comes down to? It's just as soon as you're promoting something. I mean, part of it is, look, people have found success with this, I'm sure. And so, of course, you want to tell everyone about it and, and it really feels like it's going to work for everyone, right? I get that. But also, like, if you've got a book, if you're an intuitive eating certified coach or whatever, I don't know, money plays at least somewhat of a role and it's a lot easier to make money when you are making exaggerated claims than it is if you're being much more watered down, right? I mean, that's the nature of marketing. Again, I wasn't like an intuitive eating fan going into this, but that was like the one thing that I didn't even consciously expect. It was just there. And so when I started the reading, started reading the book, it was like, oh, ah, oh, shit, man. Like, well, <laughs> so much for that. Everyone sucks, basically, is the message I get from that. And also, you know, this idea that like eating junk food is always emotional, right? Chocolate starts to take on the same emotional connotation as a peach. Like sometimes we just eat chocolate because it's delicious and we just want chocolate. Like it's not, it's not always emotional eating, at least for me. Isn't that the trope? The fat girl gets rejected and so she cries into a tub of ice cream on the couch, right? Wasn't that in, wasn't that in, um, what, uh, Brid Bridget Jones? And it, it's been like in a million movies, right? Like maybe fat people eat not because they're just emotional wrecks, right? And depressed and all of that. Maybe they eat food because it tastes good and because their brain is telling them to eat all the ice cream. Again, I know intuitive eating is all about like, don't shame people, don't shame people. And and I believe that they, they're sincere when they say that. Of course, of course, I believe that. But I think this focus on you only want the chocolate for emotional reasons because you've let it have this power over you it's kind of feeding into that trope. And again, it's not supported by the evidence. We want the chocolate because it's fucking chocolate and chocolate is good and it's better than peaches. <laughs> this is so dumb. Like you're not helping people by telling them at some point they'll magically not, you know, uh, like these foods as much and they'll be just as good as bananas and oranges and broccoli. Like you need to be honest with people. You like these foods because of their physical properties. We know exactly why these foods are so delicious. It's perfectly rational to want the chocolate instead of the peaches. You have to, you have to learn that about your brain in order to learn how to deal with that, how to get around it, and how to ultimately win the battle, so to speak, the battle with these like horrible foods, <laughs> you know, because of our damned food environment that is really hard to fix, right? I, I don't think you're doing anyone any favors by telling them that, that no, 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 that doesn't exist. It's just because you've restricted food for so long. 